Shalom, y'all. Welcome to Wednesday night. It's uh, another night in the neighborhood, but uh, I'm glad you joined me. I had some interesting interesting day today. So as we go through, I, I never finished last week. I never finished chapter 12. And so I want to go back right now and start tonight. The idea that I'm going to get across is what comes after Gog. What comes after Gog and Magog? You see, we left off last time talking about Mashiach ben Yosef and how he was going to be the character who preceded our what would be called the Messiah. And in the course of our going through it, I, I went through and tried to specifically talk about that character. But there's two other possibilities that I, I want to introduce you to. The second possibility is Mashiach ben Yosef is simply when they talk about their in mourning, they're mourning of, over all of those who have passed away through the tragedies of war, not just that war, but all wars. And so it, it's a different way of looking at it. But for the third one, I want you to open up your Bible, if you got one, to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I want to read to you that first verse, or I want you to read along that first verse, and and we'll go from there. It, it begins by saying, if you're ready, so Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12.1. And remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of evil come. Now he's talking then about a child growing up and a child cannot be evil, technically. He does not break the law until he reaches the age of the law. So that's really what they're talking about there. But look how it goes on. And years after, about which you will say, I have no desire in them. In other words, I have no desire to sin. What will reach, what will have to happen in order for you to no longer have a desire, the inkling, the, et, the yetzerah, to actually want to, well, not sin. That's the question. That's the statement that we start with. So according to our story then, as we're going through this, I got two people waiting. Hold on a second while I join them in. Okay, so we have this idea of what will cause us not to want to sin. What what will have to happen to our inclination? You realize God gave us choice. He gave us a, a, the the choice of doing good and the choice of doing evil. Now the the yetzer yetzer hara is the evil inclination, but we do need that evil inclination in in many ways. You and I would never have gone to work had we not had the desire to make money. We would never have gotten married had we not found the opposite sex attractive. All of that can be attached to the Yetzer Hara. But all the good is, is beyond that. But now we're talking about killing the Yetzer Hara and mourning over its loss. Why would you mourn the loss at this point in your life, well past the point of, of understanding. Well, we will cry because at this point in time, because we have the Yetzirah, and because we want to do good, we actually are building in kids' terms, brownie points, rewards. But what happens when the Yetzirah no longer functions? Can I do anything anymore in which I will receive some sort of reward for it? Or are rewards done with at that point in time? Well, that's a question that I'm still working on the answer. So I thought I'd just save that for later. But let's go back to the story. Moses, Messiah is coming does not mean that the Messiah will arrive during the Battle of Gog and Magog. The chances are he will not arrive until after it's over. 
Now, that seems like a shock. If he's going to be the Messiah who takes care of everything, certainly he should arrive in order to bring discipline to the world. But the answer to that question is easier. God will save the world. God will punish, not the Messiah. That's not going to be his role. There's going to be certain things that he does do. It, we're going to be talking tonight in a lot of ways about the world to come. The world to come will arrive after the last battle, battle of Gog and Magog, or at least that's what I'm understanding. The Torah tells us that we live well and fulfill our purpose, we'll receive a reward. Now, Sanhedrin, which is in the Jewish, uh, the Jerusalem Talmud, Sanhedrin uh, 10 1, let me tell you the difference. There's two Talmuds. There's the Babylonian Talmud, the Bavli, and then there's the Jerusalem Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud is much smaller. It basically is written regarding Israel proper. The Babylonian covers world, goes outside of itself. But in the Jerusalem Talmud, it, there is this very interesting thought that comes it's, it implies, or actually it doesn't imply, it actually says every Jew will make it to the world to come. Now, wait a second. Does that mean to tell me that there are no evil Jews? There are no Jews that are not going to make it. Does that mean that Ahaz and all the corrupt things that he did means he's not going to make it to, to wherever? And the answer is No. Now, the reason that line was put in there is because with all of the travail that they've gone through, you can imagine that it's easy to give up. There's a lot of times when we don't feel like we're adequate. And so the point was to encourage them to move higher, to repent, to come back and go through that process. Get closer to God. But we know for a fact, well, actually, later on in that same verse, it talks about the fact that there will be those who do not make it. One of those groups that won't make it, according to Sanhedrin 98, the same, same Talmud, it says, he denied the resurrection of the dead, therefore he will not have a share in the resurrection. So we understand, they understand that there is a resurrection. I remember in the New Testament, that was an argument that was going on in, in among the Sad, Sad, Sadducees and the Pharisees, whether there was or whether there wasn't. And that argument is found in the Talmud. But also, as we understand that, then we have to understand that this argument had a, a point. And the point is, who will make it into the world to come? Who will be there? Who will be resurrected, if you will? Because that's another point, what goes on. Now, in talking about this world to come, there are two separate places that we have to understand. The first one's called Gan Eden. When we die, we have to go somewhere. The question is, where do we go? The Jew understands, and I believe it's the same for us, we will go when, if we're ready, to Gan Eden. There's an upper Gan Eden, there's a lower Gan Eden. The upper Gan Eden is for the truly righteous, those who are, well, they're head and shoulders above way, where we are. They have untold amounts of understanding that we don't have yet. We would go to the lower. You see, Gan Eden is going to be about plowing, not dirt, plowing Torah, learning and learning and learning. In fact, it'll be so exciting that even one minute in Gan Eden is worth more than all the happiness we've ever had on this planet. Just one minute there. And what are we doing? We're plowing. Imagine that. In Psalms 24, 2 and 3, it says, Who may ascend to the mountain of God? Now, normally we think of that as going to heaven, going to paradise. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So what are the requirements to make it into Gan Eden? Clean hands, a pure heart. In other words, it's understanding our 
what we have done with our lives and it's understanding our emotions, how we've taken care of our emotions. Now, there's a second part to this, and that's the part that's called the era of, re of uh, resurrection, the era of the resurrection. This also comes in the world to come. And actually, it's the fourth level. Nothing is one level. Everything is levels. So let's break down the levels so you understand. Everybody who makes it through Gog and Magog enters into this next world level which is called the world to come the world to come now the world to come is just that it's this world it's the one we're a part of right now the difference will be that they'll be taking away the yetzer hara the second world is the more lofty world and that's the world of gan eden that's the world where after we've passed on, this is where we hope to be. Then there's a third level, which is called the era of the Messiah. This is when David, King David, whoever that is, whether that's really King David, which Ezekiel 37 says it is, or whether it is something else entirely different. But it's or another person from David's lineage. And remember when we were talking about Jehoiakim, not Jehoiakim, but Jehoiakim, who only ruled for three months and 10 days, he was the only one who was able to establish a lineage that would continue the line of David. He was the last in the line at that point in time. And so through him, who had children when he was 60 years old, while he was in Babylon, continued to maintain the line because Zedekiah, who was in the line, died. Jehoiakim, who was in the line, died. Uh, uh, Josiah was dead. There was nobody left in the lineage of Solomon through David on out. So we begin to see that there's going to be an heir of the Messiah. He will arrive after the battles of Gog and Magog. God will settle those, and we'll see that in the next chapter. So the world to come will follow this third world or third war that we're going to be talking about. And the fourth level is going to be the level of resurrection of the dead, which will come at the very end. So there's really going to be history is going to go on for a while. Now, as we go through this, our neshama, if our neshama, our third level of our soul, the true level of our soul, if it's not ready to go, in other words, it needs to be polished. We need to eliminate some of the dross that we've been carrying. It goes to what we call Gehenna. Most people want to call it hell. That's not the purpose of this place. The purpose is to clean us up, to make us ready to go into this world of purity. That's where we're going to go. Gan Eden is a pure world. Now, as we get to this point, then, we're understanding now that there's going to be a, a lot happening. All these events are going to be triggered by what happens in Chapter 12. They're going to be triggered by this third world war that's coming. That's going to be the trigger. Now, I need to apologize and I need to apologize because I started talking to you about chapter 12 as though it was already history. I know that Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are history. And I took you through a list of how the events occurred and what year they occurred. And I could give you exact dates. I can't do that with Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. You see, 12, 13, and 14 are still prophetic. They have not happened yet. They may not happen, depending on the world, or actually the Jew. They make the decision of what's happening. Moses, if you remember Exodus chapter 33, and I've talked with this on, on Sunday morning, but for the rest of you, the idea is on Exodus chapter 33, Moses was talking with God, requesting to that he make his ways known to him. Now, when it says it makes its ways known to him, what is he actually asking for? 
most of us think that what he's talking about is he's asking us, why do the good people suffer and why do the wicked prosper? That's not the question. In fact, there is no answer to the question he gave. He gave a metaphor. He said, Moses, no one has seen my face. Well, what's that got to do with this question? Moses, you cannot see my face, but what I will do is I will put you in this cleft of the rock. I will put my hand across it and I will pass before you and you will see me from behind. Front, back. In other words, to see and know everything face to face or to see it from the back. In other words, you still have the face that you don't know. There was still mystery in the future. The future was something that they that Moses wanted to know about. That's what he was looking for as he goes through this. My face you may not see. Okay. As we go through this idea that the face is something that we can't see, I want to go back to, well, I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 59, and I want you to go to verses 20 and 21. Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21. Aren't you glad you got to use your Bible? I remember going to the church many times, and I never had to open my Bible one time. And I thought, what a waste. How can we ever possibly practice what we're supposed to be doing? Well, in Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21, I read, And a Redeemer shall come to Zion, and to those who repent of transgressions in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which is upon you and is my words that I have placed in your mouth, shall not move from your mouth or from the mouth of your seed. And from the mouth of your seed, seed, said the Lord, from now until eternity. What's going to keep the world from having to go through a third world war? First line. And those who repent, when it talks about those who repent, he's talking about all the children of Jacob, not just a handful, not just the smartest ones, all of them. If Israel could have, could keep two Sabbaths in a row, two Sabbaths in a row, the world would enter into the world to come never needing to go through this war, never. But that's not going to be possible. I want to look at chapter 13 now, start looking at chapter 13, which is a very interesting chapter. It begins by saying, on the day a spring shall be opened for the house of David, and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for perfect or pers yeah perfection or purification, and for sprinkling. Now that verse, this is not the only place that verse occurs. You see, you find it in the book of Joel, chapter four, verse eighteen, and you also find it as a almost an entire chapter in the book of Ezekiel when he begins to talk about the third temple, Ezekiel 47, a significant event happens here. And we need to, I think, you need to understand all the triggers that are going to go into this because this is an amazing thing. First off, it says on that day, the spring shall be opened for, not from, but for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for purification and for sprinkling. Okay, so this stream that's coming, this spring that's going to spring, has two purposes. One is for purification and the other is for sprinkling, but actually they're the same thing. When we were reading the uh, Mount Sinai experience, 
And we looked at the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. We found that there were 620 words. 620, not a mistake. That was intentional. 620. 613 spoke to the laws the, the Jewish people had to honor. <clears throat> Seven spoke to the Medei Noach, those who kept the seven basic laws. Two entirely different groups. But when we get down and look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, we get the same Ten Commandments, but it takes him 88 more words to tell us the same Ten Commandments. So actually, he doesn't tell us exactly the same ten. Why not? When he gave the first ten, he gave it to us from a level much higher than the book of Deuteronomy gives us. Much, much higher. It comes from the throne of God. It comes from the world that they call Beriah. What you and I are reading comes from the world of the angels, Yetzirah. And therefore, there was 88 more words. Now, if you go back to the book of Exodus and back to chapter 20, you know that when Moses was receiving the words, what did he see or what did the people on the ground see? Thunder and lightning and dark skies, ominous clouds. But there was also a fire, a black fire. Now, if you look at your pages of your book, you'll notice you have black fire there. Black fire on white fire. Because you see every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, every letter, every pen stroke has significance. And so the black fire is that mystical fire that's there. And if you were truly a, a Kabbalist, a mystic, you would be able to go through those letters and you would be able to understand and decipher the meanings of each and every letter that made up those 620 words. But you and I aren't. We can't get there. But God did not leave us alone. You see, besides the 620 that he originally gave that they could not keep, he made them keep those pieces after Moses shattered them in the same container as the ones that he had made later. But as he's making the ones later, you'll see that, he, again, dark clouds, fire, darkness, everything's around them. But there's one difference, the 88 words. Well, what's, what's different about the 88 words? The word that is created, the gematria of 88, creates the word stream, brook. Water was coming down that mountain. Just like there's going to be water coming from the Temple Mount. It's not that complicated, but this water is coming to us. It's important to understand what's going on. But then the question is, how does that help us when we talk about purification? How does that, what's that about sprinkling got to do with it? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. In Ezekiel, 36 is, leads us into the wars of Gog and Magog in chapter 38, but I want you to understand something that's going to be coming at around the same time. He begins to prepare us by saying, for I will take you from among the nations and gather you from all the countries. That's what's been going on since 1948. And I will bring you to your land. Notice what he says next. I will sprinkle clean water. Remember chapter 12 or 13, verse 1, sprinkling. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean from what? All your impurities. P 
purification and from all the abominations which I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit which will I put within you and I will take you away take away your heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and bring it upon bring it about that you will walk in my statutes. Now it doesn't say he's going to force us but he's going to bring it about so that we will walk in it. Well, how are we going to be able to do that with our humanness? The only thing that will help us is if he what takes away the evil inclination. Makes it so easy to do it. We can't fail, but some of us will. Because you see, during this period in time, people will still die. But they won't have the evil inclination. And it goes on to say, then will you dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you will be a people to me and I will be to you as a God. Imagine that. So in 12.1, we begin to understand that there's going to be water flowing through the house of David. And actually the water starts, according to Ezekiel 46, the water actually starts in the temple. It flows from under the curtains, out, down the sidewalk steps, around the altar, and out through the gate. Goes towards the, the, the palace, out to the river, Jordan. From there, it flows south to the Dead Sea. Now, the water that's flowing is living water. And if it's living water and it reaches the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea will no longer be dead because it will be filled with living water. There are times, in fact, it was just last year, when fishermen were actually fishing in the Dead Sea. You see, the water was flowing so hard last year that it literally moved the salt water and fresh water occupied that. And so we understand that fresh water will overcome the salt water. Now, we're still going to need salt, so there will be a reservoir of salt that won't be a part of the Dead Sea. But that's not the end of it. Before it reaches the Dead Sea, there's also going to be a turn, and it turns west, and it reaches the Mediterranean Sea. That's what it says. Now, once it reaches the Mediterranean Sea, can you imagine what fresh water will do to the oceans? They, too, will become fresh. Not only that, along the banks of this river that's now being formed will be trees. What kind of trees? Every kind of tree that bears fruit. Every kind. In fact, originally, all trees were to bear fruit. And if you remember a character called Yule Gibbons, you understand that he could eat any part of a pine tree. Well, all parts of trees will become edible, even the leaves. There will be nothing that will not be tasty. That's what it's apparently going to be. Not only that, alongside the trees, the trees will also be for healing. So we're purified with this water. We're healed with this water along the edge. And not only that, it continues on. And if you're standing there along the river, you'll also notice that you're going to be elbow to elbow with all the fishermen because you see that water will be so full of fresh fish, not just fish from the Dead Sea or Jordan, the Jordan. It will be filled with fresh fish from the oceans. Literally all kinds of fish will be found there. An amazing set of events. But we need to understand about the sprinkling. You see, water flowing doesn't sprinkle. But yet, we know that there's going to be something necessary in order for us to be cleansed, besides jumping into the pool of water or going through a baptismal. You see, there's also going to be what's called sprinkling, in which we're going to need the para aduma, the ashes of the red heifer. 
Now, if you had a, a look, you could go back and you would find there's a whole Parsha dealing with the hukat. The hukat is the animal, the heifer. You see, God had already ordained before the, the golden calf, before the sin of the golden calf, he created for us a way. He does it all the time. He always provides. And so he had Moses take a calf, a red heifer, a female calf, can't be older than two years. The calf was slaughtered. The blood was removed. The ashes were burned on the fire. And the ashes were put into what they call a kalel, which was a clay jar, which was sealed with, with cow dung. And the first ashes went in there. Now, as the story goes, those ashes then were sprinkled on those first Jews that were did not die because of the sins of the golden calf. And it continued on through. People needed, because of dead bodies, they needed to be cleansed. And so that ashes of the red heifer were the cleansing from death. Now, as we go along, we'll find that there were nine calves that have already been slaughtered. What will come <clears throat> and what's happening now in Texas and in Israel, they are raising heifers, red heifers, for the purpose of creating a calf ready for sacrifice, ready for it. The only problem is you have to have the ashes of the old calves first. In other words, you'll slaughter the other, the new calf, put him in the fire, you'll place the kalel on top of him, and the ashes will run together. Now, after the ashes have run together, the next point is that they will be again connected. That will be the filling. And again, it will be used to purify everyone from death. So that will be something that's coming. Now, some people say, well, let's just go slaughter a calf now, if it's completely red, and go from there. Well, the only problem with that idea is the fact that, well, you and I, well, let's put it this way. The rabbis today are wonderful, but they're not as good as Moses, nor are they as good as the generations since Moses. In, Hebrew, in Judaism, there's a thing called Yored Toledot, the descending of generations. In other words, as we think we're getting technologically smarter, we are probably getting more spiritually dumb. I take that from this. I don't know about most rabbinical Jews. I, I'm just from an un understanding at this point. In the Jewish re culture, reading the five Parsh, five sections of Torah is important. Less important are the rest of the Torah, the Nach, that which is the history and, and the prophetic part, or the, the Ketavim, that, that's the part of the writings. That's the part where Jan Daniel was at. And for many years during the period of what's called the period of enlightenment, which is 17th, 18th, 19th century, the, the higher ups decided that they no longer needed to read that. We needed to spend our time reading the other. And we didn't need to use the Talmud. We didn't need, we just needed the insights of the Torah itself. And so a lot of time was lost. And a lot of Jewish people have lost the understandings of what's in the histories and the prophecies. They have just simply lived on what has been given in the Torah, which is fine, but it's not complete. I've always told my wife that uh, that uh, God wrote the first five books and the rest is commentary, and it is. But by saying commentary does not mean it has lesser value. There is always value in it. It's just that we need to make sure that we read God's word and also go to the other now about the, <clears throat> excuse me about the middle of the 18th century 
and actually before that, we created the half Torah. The half Torah, when when they were Jews were denied by Rome that they couldn't read the Torah anymore, they read the half Torahs, sections of the of the history books, sections of the writings, and those became what they would read on a regular basis. But so far, if you begin to look at your art scrolls or whatever, most of them only make a reference to it. They don't give them to you actually there so that you can read them. They'll tell you to go find it here. And a lot of people just don't go find. So we have to have, again, the original ashes, the ones that Moses started with, Obviously, some have been used, but you continue to mix it with the other nine, and now you're reaching the level of 10. Okay, so we should still be able to do it. No, you're missing one other important fact. Well, what's that? What clean place are you going to make the sacrifice on? You see, there was only one place that was identified as being clean enough for that to happen. That place was the Mifkad on the Mount of Olives, the Mifkad altar. That was the only place that they were allowed to sacrifice at. The Mifkad altar was the same place where the 70 bulls were sacrificed every year during Sukkot. Sukkot. Last words in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, the last verse. Everyone will have to go up to Jerusalem. And when will we come? Sukkot. Sukkot. Interesting choice. So as we're going through this, then, we have to understand that there are certain things that are going to have to happen. There's going to have to obviously be this process that is going to go through. Friends of mine and some of the guys I've been with in Indiana know a character called Larry born trigger larry goes yearly to jerusalem or to israel in hopes of uncovering the ashes of the red heifer he's been thwarted multiple times actually it began with vendel jones vendel jones started doing it in the 60s he had a wife back then who could read a scroll well we can all read scrolls right well the scroll was not in traditional hebrew It was an ancient Hebrew, a paleographic Hebrew. And his wife, who was Lebanese at that time, she could read it. And so she translated it for him and gave it to him. And he began to go down into the Jordan Valley and wandered back and forth up in the valley looking for a creek, a wadi. And next to this water, wadi was going to be a cave with two columns. Having found it, he begins with friends to unearth the cave. In the first couple of years, he was fortunate. He found a little cruise of oil wrapped in a palm leaf, took to have it uh, analyzed, and found out that it had all the ingredients of the anointing oil that was used on the high priest and on David and on Saul and all of the others. Years later, because they were blocked from coming back, you see at the foot of that mountain happens to be a kibbutz, a communist kibbutz, who had influences in Israel, in Jerusalem, with the Bureau of Antiquities. They were blocked from coming back. Every once in a while, they would get permission. They would go up and do some more digging. And one year, they went up and started digging, not from the front side where the people down below could see it. They were at the back side, looking for another way into the cave. And lo and behold, in this dirt, this brown clay dirt, was 2,000 pounds of red stuff. They took the 2,000 pounds. Well, actually, they took a small bag of it back to sample. Well, actually, before they even did that, they took that bag and they sat it down because they were going to continue to dig. Well, it ended up in the sun. And lo and behold, this dry dust began to emit 
water vapor. They got it back to the to being assessed. They opened up the bag and they could smell cinnamon. They left it with the lab. At the end of the day, they came back to see what he had found out. And lo and behold, the entire lab smelled like incense. His clothes reeked with incense. Next day, new clothes, back in the lab, same results. Seven days in a row, the smell in that lab was nothing but incense. Now, according to the assessment, this was truly the incense that was used in the tabernacle or in the temple. The rabbis didn't agree with that. They wouldn't accept that opinion. So technically, they have not found the incense, even though they found the incense. And since they found the incense, they put it in a safe place. The only problem is it's no longer there. It's all gone. Now, they didn't use the 2,000 pounds. Something happened to it. You know, the amount is strange because it's the same amount of, of tonnage that you need in order to perform sacrifices every day of the year, twice a day, and three times on Yom Kippur. So th when we look at that first verse, He's telling us more in that first verse than simply that there's water flowing down a hill. He's telling us that this water has a real purpose and mixed with the ashes of the red heifer provides for purification. Purification. How good would it feel to be purified? Well, go to the second verse. It's easier. It goes on to say, it will happen on that day. And now it doesn't say exactly what that day is, but that day is going to happen. The word of Hashem, master of legions, that I will eliminate the names of idols from the land and they will not be mentioned again. I will also remove the false prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. Well, we know the spirit of impurity is not the impurity itself. It is the aroma or the air that is filled with evil, that which is not acceptable. Now, when we think about an idol, we usually limit ourselves to Osiris or Zeus or something like that. But an idol can be almost anything. I remember when I was down at Tel Tamar and we were working on a dig, they, were, they have... They've been digging there for years and cleaning the area out. And they had little statues. Couldn't have been much more than four to six inches tall. Those little statues were idols. In the days of Solomon, idols were still in the country. Solomon may have been pure, but his many wives were not. So idolatry was everywhere. But in those days, or in the day yet to come, there will be no idols. Now, when it talks to idols, we're going to have to include those statues that we have in the Catholic Church. Those crosses that have Yeshua hanging from it. Whatever you look around, those things have to come out. And so does the Kaaba that's in um, Mecca, in which they say that was originally the house of Abraham. All of that will disappear. All the evil inclination will disappear. That's a promise of what's going to happen. None of that will be there. All of it will be gone. Now he goes on to say in that, that third verse, it will happen when a man will prophesy falsely. Like there isn't people today falsely prophesying what's going to happen, what's going to come. We're always about predictions. I know many people listen to, to not my Daniel so much, but all of the prophecies. 
because we want to know what the future holds. But that's not all that the prophets did. You see, some of the prophets, there were hundreds of thousands of them in Israel. We only have 55 listed because only 55 talked to the world. The rest simply ministered one-to-one -one or one-to-a-small group and advised them. That was their gift, foresee what they should do, where they should go. But then there were others that Jeremiah had run into. Because you see, Jeremiah spent 30 plus years prophesying from the days of Josiah all the way through the days of Zedekiah, always prophesying. In fact, he even prophesied when he went to Egypt because they dragged him down there. All that time, there were those that were doing just the opposite. He would tell them the truth. They would say, no, we have a God who is a loving God, and it won't happen to us. He will never tear down his temple. He will never give up his city. Don't listen to Jeremiah. How many people do you think Jeremiah almost had persuaded before all the thousands of false prophets had left him without? Over and over and over again. Can you imagine spending 30-some years of your life telling people and thinking that they're going to change and they're going to go home and they're going to listen to their local rabbi or their local prophet and go back to the way they were. Now there's going to be th many of these. Man will prophesy falsely in the house that his father and his mother, those who bore him will say to him in the future, that his father and mother, those who were bore him, will say to him, you should not live, for you have spoken falsehoods in the name of Hashem. In other words, there's going to come a time when people will understand that they are literally saying lies. And who will be the ones who are going to tell them first? Their mother and their father. Why? Because that's going to be the people they're going to come to first. See, I told you that was going to happen. Well, you didn't tell me that, but, and we continue on over and over again. I've talked for 48 minutes. I'll finish this chapter next time. Basically, this chapter is kind of a prelude or an intermission, actually, because chapter 14 is far bloodier. It's very graphic. But this chapter is not so graphic. In fact, that's why I think I, I called it What Comes After Gog. Not the Gog adventure, not the Gog itself, because that's chapter 14. This is going to come after the wars are over. So I want to end this at this portion at this point in time and, and offer you the opportunity to ask questions or to talk. Think out loud. Please think out loud. What what can you understand or what do you now see that you maybe didn't see before? What questions might you have after I talked for so long?